What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Insurrection Inc. podcast. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the show. And welcome to this week's edition of Insurrection Inc. We got Porter, we have Jay, and we have myself here, Stratty, but I got to say this is the interview I've been most excited for. We have the Lincoln assassin himself, Thomas DiLorenzo. He is an associate of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, a senior fellow, uh, my bad, a research fellow at the Independent Institute, and a recently retired professor from the Loyola University, uh, Maryland Selinger School of Business. He holds a PhD in economics from Virginia Tech, and he is perhaps most famous for his uh, series of books on Lincoln, which includes The Real Lincoln, Lincoln Unmasked, and his newest book, The Problem with Lincoln. How are you doing today, Mr. DeLorenzo? I'm doing just fine. Pleased to be with you guys. All right. Well, let's just jump right into it. So uh, I wanted, you know, of course, we're going to hit on Lean, but I wanted to ask some questions uh, before about other people. So I guess I'll start with this since it's a current thing that's going on. What do you think about the Trumpian uh, populism going on in America today? And do you think it has any uh, positive or negative effects for the liberty movement specifically? Uh, well, I think uh, one reason why he is so hated and reviled by the Democrats and the uh, the uh, and, and the Republicans that are known as Never Trumpers is that uh, he sort of uh, uh, kicked over the apple cart when he got elected because I think the Democrats assumed they would have eight more years of socialism after eight years of socialism under Obama with Hillary Clinton after which it would be uh, irreparable. They would, they, would, they would have cemented in place some version of the Green New Deal, central planning and the, under the guise of uh, environmentalism and all their other programs. And, uh, but the, uh, the, the working class, basically those are Trump's voters, the middle class working class thought otherwise and voted him in. And they were shocked and outraged. And uh, as you guys know, uh, some of these people, the top Democrats, uh, and a lot of the people on television and the media, it seems like every moment of their lives since then have been filled with hatred and anger and resentment over this. And, and I love it. I think it's, it's a great thing for, for the world that these people are, have become so hateful and angry and have so much stress that will shorten their lives. And so uh, that's one good thing that, uh, that I see uh, with Trump course, you know, whoever takes control of the gargantuan federal government, uh, you have to take into mind that we have almost 250 years of accumulated powers. And so a lot of bad things are going to happen, no matter who is president. But at least uh, that one good thing uh, happened that it made so many of the right people angry. And, uh, and so uh, that's, that's one good thing, in my opinion. It, for sure. Um, I didn't know if Jay was about to ask something, uh, but oh, no, go I'm, ahead then. I'm organizing things back, back here. So just, Okay. <laughs> well, then I, I can build off of that. Speaking of accumulated powers, uh, something you, you talk about that you're not quite as well known for because of your Lincoln books is you actually uh, have written a good bit about Hamilton as well. Uh, he was one of the first ones to expand the scope of the federal government significantly. And uh, something I didn't know until I, I read your work and listened to some of your lectures was about how Hamilton got his position as Secretary of the Treasury under Washington. Can you talk a little bit about how he came to that position and some of the things he did while he was in it? Uh, yeah, this is from my book, Hamilton's Curse. that was published uh, some years ago. And uh, yeah, how Hamilton became Treasury Secretary. He was a young man. And uh, it was the end of the American Revolution. The end was near. And he wrote a big long letter to Robert Morris, who at the time was uh, probably the wealthiest man in America. Today, we would call him a defense contractor. Uh, as, uh, as far as that goes, he, you know, he had a lot of contracts from the government, uh, yeah, such as it was during the Revolutionary War. And he was a business leader uh, of the uh, sort of the Philadelphia, New York uh, business uh, network. And so Hamilton, being uh, a smart guy, and uh, a, a world-class butt kisser, 
wrote the richest man in the country uh, a letter and, uh, and basically saying, you know, uh, I, I think your ideas for what the economy should look like after the war are all wonderful. And then the, the ideas were basically a national bank run by politicians that would provide cheap credit to politically favored businesses, protectionist tariffs to uh, protect mostly uh, northern state manufacturers, uh, such as it was. We, of course, this was before electricity, but so manufacturing was shops and, and you know not even mass production yet. But still, uh, there was manufacturing of uh, clothing, farm tools, textiles, and so forth. And so, uh, you know, protectionism for that and what we today call corporate welfare, mostly for road and canal building companies to build roads and canals so that these businesses could, at, at taxpayers' expense, ship their goods uh, to market. And uh, before that, Hamilton, uh, I, I, in my research, I read Ron Chernow's biography of Hamilton, the Pulitzer Prize winning biographer. Uh, the, the, the musical Hamilton that was on Broadway for such a long time is based uh, mostly on that book. And, and Cherno, I think, even had a small part, uh, at least on one night, uh, from what I read in the musical. But anyway, he says that uh, uh, Hamilton knew next to nothing about economics and finance, unlike Thomas Jefferson, who was very well read, his nemesis, Jefferson. And so he uh, contacted Timothy Pickering. Timothy Pickering was uh, uh, the adjutant general of George Washington's army. He became Secretary of War and Secretary of State under President George Washington. And he was from Massachusetts, and he was known to know something about finance and economics. So Hamilton writes uh, Timothy Pickering, a senator. He was also a senator from Massachusetts later on. He writes him a letter saying, uh, what can I read to learn something about economics and finance? So he sent him basically Cliff Notes. They, you know, I don't know if you guys even know what Cliff Notes is, but they're online now. But if you want to, you say you're going to take a course in uh, English literature in college, you can get the Cliff Notes version. That is a very short summary of some of the main literature, English literature, things like that, and whatever, calculus, whatever. But it's very abbreviated. And so he sent them basically some pamphlets, mostly mercantilist pamphlets. Uh, from uh, British mercantilists. And that was what uh, Hamilton learned. He learned the lingo and the language enough to compose this letter to uh, Robert, Robert Morris. And then the story goes <clears throat> that uh, relayed by um, Cherno, Ron Cherno, that's spelled C-H-E-R-N-O-W, if you want to look up his book on, online. Uh, he said, uh, George Washington turned to Hamilton and said, I didn't know you knew anything about uh, finance. We never talked about it. But if Robert Morris wants you to be the Treasury Secretary, I guess uh, you, you'll you be the Treasury Secretary. So that's how he got the job as Treasury Secretary, as basically sort of the political water boy for these big business interests of the Federalist Party to, to be their man inside the Washington administration to get their program through a national bank, protectionist tariffs, and, uh, and corporate welfare. And Hamilton called that the American system, even though in actuality what it was was the rotten, corrupt uh, British mercantilist system without the British. And of course the Jeffersonians and Jefferson himself was outraged by this because this was the system they had just fought a revolution to escape from. They had seceded from the British Empire and that was a big rotten part of the British Empire. And, and so uh, that's where the opposition came. And so they didn't really get their way. Uh, Hamilton tried. He did get a national bank. It was called the First Bank of the United States. Uh, after they had, they had a bank prior to that, the Robert Morris got uh, the, the government to put in place something called the Bank of North America. And it lasted one year before the currency became so devalued and so untrusted that it was privatized. And so they turned around and they did create the first bank of the United States, but, um, but he did not get his protectionist tariffs and he did not get corp corporate welfare for road and canal building. That would take another 70 years or so when Lincoln became president. So I got a question regarding Hamilton since you, uh, since you just had that full dive into him. Would you agree that the only thing Aaron Burr did wrong was he didn't do it soon enough? <laughs> yeah, that was, you, you must have heard one of my jokes about that. I, 
uh, Gary North, my old friend Gary North, once said that when he saw that I'd written a book on Hamilton, said that he had actually created an Aaron Burr Society at some point, and they made ball caps, and the, the logo on the ball cap said, not soon enough, and it's kind of a, kind of a silly, silly joke, because of course Aaron Burr is a man <laughs> who shot and killed Hamilton in a duel uh, in, uh, in 1804, and so, but I don't want to advocate uh, violence against anybody, but that's, that's what you're referring to, I assume. You must have heard one of my videos where I, where I mentioned uh, Gary North's quip. Yeah, or clued me into it. Yeah, so. yeah I, I told him about that earlier today. Uh, yeah. I, we're going to go on to Hamilton soon, or not Hamilton, Lincoln soon, because you mentioned that. But um, one other question. Have you seen the Hamilton play? No, I didn't think it'd be worth the two thousand uh, dollars for a ticket, to, or whatever whatever it was for a ticket to see the play. And, yeah, it's uh, not worth it. <laughs> I watched yeah, it on Disney I Plus. Think so? It was it was singing and uh, rap music and stuff like that. I, uh, I I didn't see what would be in it for me. Oh well, you don't like state propaganda in the form of a musical. <laughs> yeah. And that's why the the, new, the same people in New York City who elected uh, Bill de Blasio mayor were huge, huge fans. That's why it was such a success. That's who went to his, uh, initially went to that play. So I thought if, if that's the kind of people who would, uh, the people who elected a self-described communist as mayor of New York City love it, then I probably won't care much for it. Very fair assessment. <laughs> One more thing. I always think it's funny when politicians today say they intend to get money out of politics and you know, it's, they say it's been a corruption of our politics or something that it, it didn't used to be like this. When the very first secretary of the treasury, the person in charge of the country's money was, you know, put in his position because of moneyed interests. I always find that kind of ironic. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. And in my book, you know, Hamilton's curse, I quote, uh, you know, there's one version of the Federalist Papers that was in print for a long, long time. And the editor uh, mentioned Hamilton, says Hamilton was one of the authors of the Federalist Papers. And he said that his tenure as Treasury Secretary was sort of a, an orgy of corruption where he used uh, the, the taxpayers' dollars, money, to buy political favors uh, all over the, the country. And so, you know, yeah, of course, this is nothing new. So whenever a politician says, uh, I want to take money out of politics, you, know, you might notice his, his, nose, his or her nose probably gets an inch or two longer every time they say that. Now, uh, Stratty, I think you had some questions about uh, Lincoln and the new book in particular, right? So my question to start off with the Lincoln stuff is, what did you miss in your first two books or what wasn't included that came in this book or why did you feel to uh, write this book? Because three books on Lincoln is quite a bit and uh, I'm very thankful for the work, but I'm just wondering like how much is there to know and how much is there that we don't know yet? Yeah, well, if you, uh, if you get into this literature and you find out who some of the big names are in the Lincoln scholarship, like David Donald, who's uh, or the, uh, the preeminent Lincoln scholar of the last generation, he wrote a lot more than three books on Lincoln. So if you're, a, if you're in this area, uh, it's not unusual. I'm not the only person in the world to have written three books on Lincoln. All the, the other, a lot of the others, uh, this guy named Gabor Borat is another big name in there. He, I don't know how many books he's written, probably at least a dozen. And, and the same, uh, uh, Harold Holzer is another big name in that literature, the Lincoln scholar uh, world. And he's written a, a whole bunch of books, so it's not unusual to write a couple of books because it's on the same uh, topic. Uh, but this, the, the genesis of my latest book, The Problem of Lincoln, is my publisher, Regnery Publishing, contacted me and they proposed another book on Lincoln. And, and I, I went back to them and said, well, I've written two already. Why do you think we need another one? And, this, and will this sell? And what can I do? So they, they talked me into, into doing it. But uh, the, the third one I wrote with, uh, uh, you know, The Real Lincoln came out 18 years ago. And so, uh, and during that 18 year period, uh, I didn't just uh, spend my time, my work time researching Lincoln and things like that. I was an economics professor at Loyola University and worked with the Mises Institute. But I did do a lot of extra research, reading, writing, debating over all these years, 18 years. And you accumulate, you learn a lot of things doing that. And also during that time, 
there are a lot, quite a few uh, new books written by other scholars who uh, I kind of think that I take credit for some of it, who I sort of opened the door and I sort of took the first step in daring to criticize Father Abraham, as he is known to some uh, you know, uh, followers of the late Harry Jaffa, for example. And, uh, and so other people uh, took the, the second step and the third step. And so I incorporate into the problem with Lincoln, not only things that I learned myself and the ideas that I had myself, but a lot of literature from other people that, uh, that, have, that have solidified some of my critiques of, of Lincoln. So I bring all of that, of that experience and 18 years of experience and research and additional thinking about this. And I also had a, a much better understanding of just who the Lincoln cult is, as, as I call it, when I wrote this book. Uh, I was sort of taken by surprise when the first book came out. I knew I was going to be harshly criticized by, uh, I guess, I, I used to tell people that I probably would have been less criticized had I written a book criticizing Jesus Christ than I did writing a book criticizing Lincoln. You, know, you, can, you can criticize all American presidents, George Washington, everybody, but for some reason, not Abe Lincoln. And, and I thought, the hell with that. You know, why, why not? He, he was a real man, a real politician. Uh, treat him like everyone else. Uh, and uh, he's not a god. He was an atheist, in fact, since I mentioned the word god. And so, and so yeah, that's, uh, I, and I even discovered some old books uh, in, the, in the interim, such as one called The Deification of Lincoln that was written in 1945 by a man named Ira Condiff. Condiff. Uh, there was really a, a, a fine piece of scholarship, and I incorporated some of that into the problem with Lincoln. And I didn't know about that book uh, when I wrote The Real Lincoln. And so, so those, those are some of the reasons why I, uh, I went ahead and wrote this, uh, this third book. And one difference with this book is there are 10, 10 appendices in it. With a lot of the documents that I refer to and, and that I did in the other books, uh, like the Corwin Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, uh, that would have prohibited the federal government from ever interfering in Southern slavery, which Lincoln supported. It's all there. The Emancipation Proclamation is in there. The, uh, the uh, constitutional ratification doc documents of New York and Virginia and Rhode Island are in there, and where they reserve the right to secede uh, in the future if uh, they decided that the uh, Union was not uh, conducive to their happiness. They use the word happiness. And so I have all these original documents in, the, in, in this uh, version. And a lot of the correspondence I've had about the book is from people saying they really like that. They like that I write about it, then there are these documents and their meaning, and then, but they're all right there. So you can read them for yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. Yeah, that makes sense. And since you talked about how he's, you know, harder to criticize than Jesus Christ or something. Why do you think that is? Why do you think uh, that there's been kind of this reinterpretation of Lincoln to, to be some sort of God? Why is he, why is it that we can't criticize him? We can criticize everyone else. Why do you think that is? Yeah. Well, you know, one, one of these books that I referred to, you know, I said that, uh, you know, some new books, very interesting new books have been published since the real Lincoln was put first published in 2002. And one of them is called The Unpopular Mr. Lincoln by Larry Tagg, T-A-G-G. -G. And in that book, he uses primary sources, meaning uh, newspaper, magazine articles, uh, and so forth of the day, of Lincoln's day, to make the case that he was by far the most hated and reviled of all American presidents during his lifetime. And he's referring to the people in the northern states. He's not, of course, everybody assumes the southerners mostly hated him. Uh, he, he was bombing their cities and their towns and, and you know, mass killing them by the hundreds of thousands. And, but, in these, but Larry Tagg is referring to the northern states. And so he was hated and reviled, but they used his assassination as a, as a, as a political uh, prop. Um, the, uh, the Secretary of War took over the corpse from Mrs. Lincoln, and they took it on a 1,600-mile train ride on display and uh, they, they, the order went down to uh, not touch the, uh, the body or the face. They wanted it to look as gruesome as possible. And you can imagine what it looked like, a man who was shot in the head several weeks later, uh, the corpse laying there on display uh, for all to, to sort of gin up and generate more hatred of the South, even though the war was over 
at the time, um, but not just hatred of the South, but uh, popularity of the Republican Party as the saviors of the world. And so after that, Lincoln became deified with the help of the New England clergy. Uh, they began uh, saying things like, uh, he died for the sins of America, just like Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. They pointed out that he died on Good Friday. Uh, and in my research, I ran across uh, once, I ran across a Harper's Magazine picture of uh, Lincoln, uh, uh, an angel with angel's wings ascending to heaven, but the head was Abe Lincoln. And, and below it was a, an open tomb. And so, there, and so you had the deification of Lincoln and this book that I mentioned by I, Ira Cardiff, uh, The Deification of Lincoln. Uh, they even rewrote the history of Lincoln's family. Lincoln hated his father so much that he never went, didn't even go to his funeral. But all of a sudden, the historians started writing about what a wonderful man and what a, what a great nurturing father Lincoln's father was, Thomas Lincoln. And they said that, it, and uh, Ira Cardiff says that uh, his mother, Lincoln's mother, was made out to be uh, you know, more pure than the Virgin Mary, and, and, and on and on and on. And so in, in the post-war years, you had this. And it wasn't, what it led to was not just the deification of Lincoln, but the deification of the government. And another thing I bring into this book that was not in the real Lincoln is uh, a book by Robert Penn Warren. And he was sort of a libertarian-ish uh, author of, uh, you know, the 1919, mid 19th century. He wrote a book called The Legacy of the Civil War in 1960. And he was, uh, and he's a very famous novelist. He wrote All the King's Men, is Robert Penn Warren. And so he wrote this book, um, The Legacy of the Civil War. And, he, and um, in it, he says that uh, one of the things that happened uh, after the war was the, uh, the Republican Party created what he called a treasury of virtue. The government pumped itself up by attaching itself to the deified Abe Lincoln, and he freed the slaves and, and saved the Union, supposedly, which uh, I'll talk about that in a minute, which I think is untrue, by the way. But anyway, it created a treasury of virtue, and they used this treasury of virtue to make the case that anything the U.S. government did from then on, and Robert Penn Warren mentions entry into World War I and World War II, is virtuous by definition, because it's the U.S. government that is doing it. And so, uh, and, and, but then Robert, Robert Penn Warren says also that now in order to buy this, to go along with this theory of a treasury of virtue, you have to forget all this history. You have to forget that Lincoln promised to, uh, to enshrine Southern slavery in the Constitution in his first inaugural address. You have to, you have to forget that uh, his whole life, he advocated the deportation of all the black people out of America. It was called colonization. You had to forget that in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, he said, I, as much as any man, want the superior position to belong to the white race. And those are his exact words. Yeah, talk about white supremacy. He literally used the word superior to, the, to uh, define his view about race. And so, and, and on and on and on. And so uh, you had to forget about all these things and erase all this history to go along with this idea that not only Abe Lincoln, but America is virtuous. And I think one of the reasons why so many Americans are offended by criti critiques of Abe Lincoln is they attach themselves to the government. They have bought the public school line that we are the government. We are the government. Of course, we have the government. I'm not the government. I don't collect taxes and spend it. Uh, you know, I, uh, the government's somebody else. But that's the, that's the line. That's the public school line that we're all taught. And, uh, and I even, even, I'll never forget a colleague of mine at Loyola, a woman with a PhD degree in economics, uh, way back when, uh, when Bill Clinton uh, bombed an aspirin factory on the day, I don't know if you guys remember the, the whole scandal, Bill Clinton had this uh, a young intern in the White House that he was having sex with, it was a big scandal uh, during the Clinton administration. Uh, uh, it was a scandal to ordinary people, but it actually made Clinton more popular somehow, so go figure that. But, but anyway, on the day that this uh, woman was to give grand jury testimony, Bill Clinton ordered the military to lo lob a bomb to, in the Sudan, the country Sudan, uh, and it because he said it was a terrorist training camp. 
Turns out it was an aspirin factory and the government later admitted it was an aspirin factory. But the, the point I'm making is this woman I'm referring to, a former colleague of mine, uh, we were talking about this when this happened and, and she was a Clinton supporter. And I was explaining to her that the administration itself eventually admitted, well, yeah, there wasn't a training camp for terrorists. It was an aspirin factory. She said, oh, the, 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 go the government would never do such a thing. And so, and this is an educated woman. She's thinking, well, I would never, I would never do such a thing. And I'm the government. Therefore, how could the government ever do such a thing? And so if a, if a woman with a PhD degree, that's intelligent, and from Berkeley, no less, uh, can fall for this public school line, well, you know, the average Joe and Jane six pack are gonna, are gonna fall for it too. And so, uh, but, but at the same time, if you read the reviews of The Real Lincoln on Amazon, I, I used to tell people there are hundreds and hundreds of them, mostly, mostly favorable. And the favorable ones are all like, throw away the fan, family Bible and put De Lorenzo's book in its place, or De Lorenzo should be hanged immediately in public, one or the other. And, uh, there's hardly any middle ground <laughs> with all those reviews. So it's, it's not as though um, I've had only critics. And it's been a big seller. It's still selling. Uh, 18 years, and uh, it's been in print for 18 years, and I'm still getting royalties checks uh, from it, from Random House, and so uh, people are still reading it. Well, I don't want to assume anything, but it sounds like you're not really a big fan of Lincoln. So I want to ask, is Skeptic. there anything Is there anything you think he did had a positive effect on the development of America throughout history? Like, anything positive at all? Well, my usual uh, line on that question is he, uh, he was a fan of the theater, as, as, you know, as far as what, what, what good things he, he did. But uh, no, I can't think of any. I mean, he, uh, he committed treason. You know, Article 3, Section 3 of the Constitution defines treason as levying war upon the United States or giving aid and comfort to their enemies. And the word there is all important here because it means United States. States is in the plural, their plural. That means it refers to the individual states, Virginia, Massachusetts, and so forth. So levying war upon the individual states is what treason is. That is exactly what Lincoln did when he levied war on the southern states. And he redefined treason himself to mean criticism of him. And the, and the mass arrested tens of thousands of northern citizens uh, and, uh, and shut down over 300 opposition newspapers in the northern states uh, by with this phony accusation of treason, which was not treason; it was free speech. And so that you know, it's, it's just you know, and that's for starters. Uh, and he, you know, he, he started the war without the consent of Congress. Congress, of course, eventually declared war, but Lincoln got the ball rolling before that. He spent four years waging war on civilians of his own country. This wasn't a war off in Europe or Asia somewhere, and there were civilians being bombed. These were Americans. These were his own citizens. He never conceded that secession was legal. Therefore, he, he considered the Southerners always to be members of his country, United States citizens, and he waged war on, on them for four years. So what can you say about a man that does that? And uh, if you read my, my uh, I tell the story of Sherman, who when he, uh, when he uh, approached Atlanta in 1864, and the Confederate Army had evacuated, and all that was left in Atlanta was about 10% of the population, which was uh, women, children, and old elderly men. And for four days, he had his artillery bomb the buildings wherever they saw human habitation. And there were dead bodies of women and children in the streets. And even some of his uh, junior officers were imploring him to, to quit it. They told him it had no military significance, but Sherman uh, was, you know, sort of a devil character. Told them uh, it'll quicken the end of the war, and he, he called he called the corpses of children in the street a beautiful sight, in his own uh, memoirs, and and that's the kind of person that was promoted and made a hero by Lincoln, and then later the the U.S. government, you know, as a whole, after the war, and they put him and him Sherman in charge of the Indian Wars, to uh, the War of Genocide against the Plains Indians for 25 years after the Civil War. And so when you look at, look at the things that Lincoln did, and on economics, it, it was total corruption. He, uh, the, the, the tariff rate went up by, uh, to 
from 15% to about 60% by the end of the war and stayed in that range uh, until 1913 when the income tax was adopted. Uh, we got uh, the National Currency Acts, which uh, created monopoly money, the greenback dollar, and the biggest corruption scandal in the history of the U.S. government up to that point by the 1870s was created by the Pacific Railway Bill. And they, had their, they got their corporate welfare at last. And in my, in my book, The Problem with Lincoln, I devote a chapter that is entitled Big, Lincoln's Biggest Failure. And his biggest failure is to do what all the rest of the world did and end slavery peacefully. And so I, I give chapter and verse of how all the other countries of the world, the British Empire, the Spanish, the French, the Danes, the Dutch, and all the northern states, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, New York, they all ended slavery peacefully without a war. And I, and I argue that uh, a real statesman could have done it in, in, a, in four years or less also, just like the British did, uh, by buying the freedom of the slaves and then legally ending it once and for all. Because uh, the slavery, after all, only benefited it didn't even benefit the slave owners that much. The, the, the people who sold the slaves to the slave owners made the biggest profit. But then the slave owners had to pay them. And so you know, the, the return to investment on slavery wasn't that great. It was the, the slave sellers, which was mostly the tribal chieftains in Africa. They're the ones that made the big bucks from slavery by ens first enslaving their own people and then selling them to Europeans and Americans. And, uh, but, but slavery didn't benefit the average hillbilly who was uh, in the Confederate Army. It, it benefited only the slave owners, which was, uh, what, 6% of the Southern adult uh, population, something like that. But it was a drag to the rest of the Southern economy and the whole U.S. economy because slave labor is inherently less efficient than free labor. You don't have the incentive to, uh, to accumulate skills because there's nothing in it for you. Uh, uh, many of the slaves were skilled in, in a lot of a lot of ways, but you don't have quite the incentive if you don't see any future in it in uh, in doing the types of things that free laborers would do. Yeah, Mark Thornton has done some a lot of good research on that, especially on the inefficiency of slave labor as an economic system. Yeah, Ludwig von Mises writes about it in. Uh, in his famous book, Human Action, the, the chapter called Work and Wages, it's uh, near the beginning of the chapter, but he talks about uh, like, uh, the work of animals and slaves and things like that compared to free labor. And, and of course, it should make total economic sense that, you know, why do you go to school and educate yourself? Why do you learn a trade and, 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 and do your best to earn money uh, with the trade? Why do you why do you try to uh, imitate Tom Woods and get a podcast and make a lot of money with a podcast? Because you see, you see a future in it. You see a payoff in it, you know? And so that's why. And so, uh, but, but if you're a slave, you don't. You don't see the future. And uh, well, that's not to mean that many of the slaves were not taught to be uh, carpenters and, and uh, you know, they weren't all just people who picked farm workers. There were a lot of uh, skilled laborers among the slaves, but still, they probably, there would have been a lot more had we had free labor. And it's not just an accident that after slavery was ended uh, that we had what's called the second industrial revolution because we had free labor. And, uh, and we had a, a much more free labor market and, and it always works better. And, uh, and by the way, you, you guys probably know who Robert Higgs is. I uh, think uh, the great his, uh, libertarian his, economic historian. His doctoral dissertation at Johns Hopkins back in the 1960s I think it was called Competition Versus Coercion. And it was about uh, what happened in the labor markets to the ex-slaves in the period from the end of the Civil War to the turn of the 20th century. And it's very interesting. There are other books about this, but it's a very uh, sort of heroic story of these people and their children, uh, you know, the slaves and the children of the slaves who were, and, and how they survived and thrived under the regime of free labor, even with Jim Crow laws and all that. Uh, they, and, and it's sort of a, a, enlightening to read uh, you know, sort of the human spirit when once given freedom and what it did. They, they started their own banks and they started their own railroad companies, education, they had their own schools, even though it was, there was still a lot of segregation and discrimination in the North as well as the South. 
you know, uh, in fact, uh, one of the points I make is I, I quote uh, Alexis de Tocqueville as saying in his famous book, Democracy in America, in the, in the 1830s, he thought, he said that the problem of race, as he put it, was worse in the North than in the South. And, and that, that's one of the things that always motivated me to, to write this, these books, is I grew up in Pennsylvania, and, uh, and this whole story, and I went to Pennsylvania public schools, and this whole story that people from the North were saint, saintly uh, crusaders uh, who uh, were willing to die by the hundreds of thousands solely for the benefit of black strangers a thousand miles away, I always thought that was a big bunch of BS. Even uh, in uh, elementary school, I'm thinking there's something wrong with this picture. And, and then I run across the great Tocqueville saying the same thing, the, the, the reality. And so just that fact alone should cause anyone to question the official story about uh, what happened in the Civil War. Yeah, and I would just like to say about the ripping off, I mean, not ripping off, trying to be Tom Woods, make a lot of money. Walter Block <laughs> thinks we're doing well. He said we're just as good as the Tom Woods show. So... <laughs> No, well, well, that's good. You should uh, you should use that as advertisement. We we have one. So we it, are. It's, it's very useful. It's uh, maybe even it's a T-shirt. May have a T-shirt made that says Walter Block says we're just as good as Tom Woods. <laughs> Wait, why haven't we done that yet? We do actually have a T-shirt T-shirt store now. Speaking of our merch shop, I just want to take a quick break from the interview to let you know about our Teespring store, where you can get a lot of kick-ass libertarian designs and a couple related to the show. All proceeds go back to the show and help us out greatly. If you want to support us monthly with fiat, you can do that at patreon.com. And if you want to support us with cryptocurrency, you can go to float.app. All the links will be in the show notes. So let's get back into the interview. Yeah. yeah when- also, when Stratty and I were <laughs> when yeah. Stratty and I were at Mises U, we told Tom Woods about that. <laughs> and he uh, what were his words? Again, he, he said that Walter Block is full of shit. Full so shit. that was <laughs> that was pretty That's another good t-shirt logo, also. Yeah. We'll have to get one of you too, yeah. uh, Tom. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, really. but anyway um, yeah three. so you mentioned earlier about how the republicans are using lincoln as a sort of treasury of virtue which is very interesting because now you see that both parties try to lay claim to lincoln you have the republicans still trying to hang on to the lineage of something from 160 years ago you have the democrats that always cite the southern strategy as to oh the party switched so really lincoln would be a democrat today and they're both trying to use him as their idol. And who has the closer vision of Lincoln, if at all? Although all political parties have, have always done this. And I write in, in um, The Problem with Lincoln, my new book, about, about how the, the Communist Party USA uh, used to hold Lincoln Lenin Day rallies in New York City. And uh, I have a little section in the book about the 1936 uh, Communist Party USA convention in Chicago. And, uh, and I have a footnote in there with a link to uh, a picture that's online. You can you, you Google it now if you want, 1936 Communist Party USA Chicago Convention. And on the stage, they had gigantic heads of, of Vladimir Lenin and Abraham Lincoln. And so it's not just the Democrats and Republicans, but the Republican Party started out as the party of uh, uh, corporate welfare. You know, they, they ran on nothing else but... Uh, 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 corporate welfare for the railroad corporations, protectionist tariffs for northern manufacturers, and, uh, and a national bank. Uh, they didn't get the national bank, but they did get the National Currency Acts and the Legal Tender Acts and, a, and the, the government monopoly of the money supply and a tax, by the way. The National Currency Act put a, a tax on competing currencies. So they did get the monopolization of the money supply. Uh, dur- during during that time. So they were always the party of corruption. And what is the first thing they did after the war, uh, I write about this in my new book, The Problem with Lincoln, is they waged a 25 year war of, of genocide against the Plains Indians and shamelessly uh, recruited ex-slaves. They were called Buffalo soldiers by the Indians. And, uh, but they were ex-slaves that were recruited to wage a war of genocide against another colored race, the you know the red the redskins, you know the Indian, the Plains Indians, and I quote Sherman himself, who was in charge of all this, General Sherman, as saying, uh, "We're not going to let a few thieving Indians stand in the way of the railroads." So it was more, uh, it was a, essentially a version of more corporate welfare for the railroads. 
by murdering the Indians. They, they killed about 45,000 of them in the Great Plains, and the rest were put in concentration camps called reservations. And this went on from 1865 to 1890. And so that's, you know, that's another legacy of Lincoln and his uh, generals in, in his, his army. And so that's the Republican Party became the party of uh, empire after that. And of course, the Democrats didn't shy away from empire. And the, the, the old Democrat Party was the party of free trade and, and Jeffersonianism. Uh, the last great Jeffersonian was Grover Cleveland of, of that era. And, and he was president in the, in the 1880s. And so he was an outlier. But apart from that, it was all these uh, sort of uh, statist interventionist Republicans. And so today's Republican Party, you know, with Trump is a little different. The, the party of Reagan always was, and the party of Bush was the party of big business, corporate welfare. Uh, Trump has shook that up a little bit, but not much. But then at the same time, he sort of, he has idolized Lincoln. He, he even has his speech writers of uh, one of his first speeches on uh, economics, Trump's first speeches on economics in 2017 was in uh, L Kentucky. He went to Kentucky because Henry Clay is from Kentucky. And, uh, and Trump was announcing that he wanted to spend a lot of money on infrastructure, government money on infrastructure. And that was the American system. That was Clay, Henry Clay, when Hamilton, after Hamilton died, Henry Clay became the political face of this cabal of corporate elitists who wanted corporate welfare protectionism in a national bank. And so uh, Lincoln, Lincoln, Trump and his speechwriters latched on to that. I don't think they, I'm not sure they even understood it, or Trump did it anyway, but he just wanted to spend a lot of money on roads and airports and, and all, federal money on that. And so they latched on to this. So the Republican Party is much more the party of, uh, party of Lincoln, uh, which in my view is a bad thing. It's not, it's not a good thing, but they've, but we live in this, this, uh, crazy world where up is down and uh, right is wrong and uh, yeah, especially in politics. And, uh, and so, uh, so that's the way it is. Well, my next question for you, and uh, we asked our listeners to submit some questions and this was the most popular one. Uh, do you have a favorite Confederate general? And if so, who? A favorite Confederate general? I don't know, Robert E. Lee, a lot of, you know, for, for a long time, thought of Lee as one of the greatest uh, Americans, not just a general, but, um, you know, Lee, uh, you guys, I don't know if you've read my book, you might know the story that uh, uh, when the war started, uh, Lincoln's first choice was Winfield Scott, and Winfield Scott was very old at the time, and General Winfield Scott, and he recommended Lee, so Lincoln offered the job to Robert E. Lee of the head of the Union Army. And of course, Lee famously said, I can't wage war against my own country. And people thought of uh, the country. And he was, he was the top graduate at uh, uh, the military academy. And he was a, a, a well-known uh, military engineer at the time. And he was considered to be the, the best officer in the United States Army at, uh, when, the, when the war came out. And he was a very articulate man too. If you read some of his letters and things, and he, he wrote letters to his wife <clears throat> saying that slavery <clears throat> is, a, is a moral sin wherever it is practiced. And, uh, and he, his, wife, and his wife, who was uh, a descendant of George Washington's wife, her, her maiden name was Custis, uh, Mary Custis Lee. And that's Mary Custis, George Washington, Martha Washington was a Custis. And, uh, and she inherited slaves and, uh, and Robert E. Lee freed them because it was a part of her, his father-in-law's will that the, uh, the slaves would be freed. And it's kind of an ironic thing that he freed his, the slaves that his wife had inherited. Uh, but uh, Ulysses Grant, uh, his father-in-law was a slave owner and Ulysses Grant was the, the overseer of his father-in-law's slave plantation before the war. <laughs> How many people know that? And they didn't let those slaves go until they had to. It was 1866 and uh, slavery was, was legally ended. And so, uh, so if you want to look at a, at a man of uh, virtue in terms of generals, you know, I don't think uh, anyone could, uh, could top uh, Robert E. Lee as far as that goes. 
uh, just as a person as well as a, a successful general. Yeah, and between Ulysses S. Grant and Robert E. Lee, I once found letters because I learned that Grant had expelled all the Jews from the border states to the south because yes. he thought because they were merchants, they're going to betray the Union. And then you can find letters of Robert E. Lee, like turning over lower commander's orders that Jewish soldiers in Confederacy couldn't return home for the high holidays. And you see this real distinction between the two. Well, yeah, the, um, yeah, the, uh, that's true. That uh, forget, forget what general order 100 or something like that to uh, evict all the Jews from this whole, whole district, several states, because uh, I think the argument was that uh, they were selling things uh, to the Confederate army, whatever. You know, you know you, an army is a, is a human civilization. They need everything that we need, food, clothing, shelter, everything like that. So, so, so he singled out the Jews to discriminate against uh, on that. I, I'm sure they were not the only ones who wanted to make a buck uh, selling stuff to the army. In fact, um, uh, when I visited Springfield, Illinois, uh, several years ago, I was invited to give a talk at the Illinois Libertarian Party Convention in Springfield. And I, and I, I visited uh, Lincoln's home and the, the Lincoln Museum is in Springfield. And he lived in the biggest house in, in what is today called Old Aristocracy Row in Springfield, Illinois. And the house next door described who the man was. He was a, a, a tin cup manufacturer and a Whig politician who got the contract to sell tin cups to the U.S. Army. How about that? And, I don't, and, he, and he wasn't Jewish because there, uh, uh, because there were, like you said, there was a lot of anti-Semitism in the, the Union Army. On the other hand, the, the um, the Secretary of War of the Confederacy was Jewish. Judah P. Benjamin was, was, he, uh, was uh, from Louisiana. And uh, there's a whole book called The Jewish Confederates because the Jews were discriminated by the, the wasps of New England and the, and, and the North so much. And they found uh, a home in the South when they, when they came here, just like the Catholics uh, when they came, they were discriminated against. And Maryland was there, you know, they first came to America and went to Maryland and they had religious freedom there more so than other places. And, and it was the New, the New England Yankees, again, who hated the Catholics, and, uh, as well as the Jewish people. And that's, you know, it's a little wonder why the South didn't want to have anything to do with these people. And so, uh, so that's an interesting part of, of history also, that you bring up that, bring up that point. And, and Judah P. Benjamin, uh, you know, I've read a whole biography of his. It's very interesting. And I, and I have a copy of the Jewish Confederates back in the bookshelf behind me somewhere in the, and that's a, another interesting part of American history that nobody uh, seems to know about. Yeah, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into those. Those actually sound really interesting. But moving from one tyrannic despot to another, Wilson is on our roster for questions. And specifically, the lies that led up to Wilson forcing the United States into World War I. So what were some of them? Because we learn about, oh, these things, you know, we learn in high school oh, these certain things led to the war, but they don't seem to be very true. So what were some of them? Oh, yeah. Well, there's, you know, the red flag, the red, a red, a red flag uh, schemer, schemers, uh, you know, sinking a ship uh, that uh, they've been going across the Atlantic providing, uh, providing armaments, you know, that, uh, and, and, you know, it was used as a... Uh, uh, an excuse for the war. In, in fact, I think uh, I used I used to, when I lived in Maryland in Annapolis, the Naval Academy is in Annapolis, and I believe that uh, the uh, part of part of that ship is is there on the grounds of the Naval Academy. To, you know, to you know, I guess you're supposed to remember this. But what you're supposed to remember, it was supposedly what you're supposed to remember, I guess, is the evil Germans sunk this ship, not that the ship was sent out as a guinea pig to be sunk as an excuse to enter World War I, as far as that goes. And of course, Wilson, um, you know, his famous uh, declaration that he wanted to make the world safe for democracy. And I would recommend on this question, um, Murray Rothbard's book on progressivism that was just uh, edited and, uh, and, uh, and published by Patrick Newman, published by the Mises Institute, that tells the story of the progressives like Woodrow Wilson and how, you know, they started out 
um, a lot of these so-called progress early progressive early, late 19th century early 20th century progressives were what uh, Murray Rothbard called uh, post millennialists and they believed that they had to create uh, use government to create uh, a kingdom of God on earth before Jesus Christ would return to earth and it would all be saved and, and so forth and so how to create that kingdom of God well they started out uh, uh, with uh, the, uh, condemning rum and Romanism, uh, rum being alcohol, so they're prohibitionists, and Romanism meaning Catholicism. So they saw those as the evil things because because these were all Protestants. These 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 uh, these people he's talking about, and then they moved on to other things. They decided, well, once we purify America with prohibition and getting rid of the Catholics. You know, let alone the Jewish people. You can imagine, you know, they, they, they weren't too friendly to the Jewish people either. Uh, then we can move abroad. And we, you know, why, why are we just purifying America? You know, in order to have a kingdom of God on earth, we need to have a kingdom of God on earth, not on America. And so part of the war, according to the progressive reasons for the war, if, if you read some of, some of their literature, was they wanted to bring uh, basically you know, what the neocons today are pretending to do to bring democracy all over the globe, which basically means uh, turning these countries into puppet governments of the of the of the Americans, well, not even of the Americans, of the neocons who run who who were in running the government until Trump came along, which is why they hate him so much with such uh, vitriol today. And so, so I consider the neocons to be the descendants of Wilson and the progressives, the Republican neocons. And there are a lot of Democrats, well, I guess, I guess uh, all the Demo a lot of Democrats are ne neoconservatives also, not just uh, Republicans. But that's where this, this, this weird thing came from, that th this idea that you can create heaven on earth. And, and World War I, our entry into World War I, was an attempt <clears throat> under the delusion that we could create heaven on earth. <clears throat> of course, all they did was cause the death of uh, thousands and thousands of Americans and other people. <clears throat> for for absolutely no benefit whatsoever to any single individual in the United States, except for the defense contractors, the, the defense contractors always make always make out uh, with war and the undertaker. You know the the people who run the cemeteries they always have a good healthy business when uh, whenever there's a war. Yeah, since you mentioned, uh, or well, since we're talking about Wilson and you mentioned Patrick Newman. And stuff. He's written a couple articles recently. There was one uh, a few months ago about a new progressive era that he's predicting, like a, a 21st century version of the progressive era. And then yeah. one that came out just yesterday, I think, that was published on Mises.org that was um, comparing Kamala Harris to Woodrow Wilson. Do you think that comparison is accurate? Uh, do, you, <laughs> do you agree with his prediction that we could have a new progressive era? Well, these people call themselves progressives, but I think they're they're much worse than progressive. They're, they're Stalinists. Uh, progressive is a nice sounding word, but if you look at the things they want to do, the, the so-called progressives, as far as I know, I mean, they, they, they were in favor of things like uh, prohibition, uh, you know, uh, taxes on, on alcohol. If you couldn't get prohibition, heavy taxes on alcohol. Uh, they, they weren't in favor of uh, the Green New Deal and uh, abolishing automobiles and abolishing cows and and all these crazy things that the uh, this people today who call themselves progressives are they're communists basically and there's nothing progressive about that but uh, and so uh, I haven't read uh, Patrick's latest article I'll have to look it up but uh, in uh, in order to answer your question but from what I see of uh, Kamala Harris and people like this there's nothing really progressive about them. They're, they're Stalinists and they're communists, and they're, uh, which is why, by the way, I think Bernie Sanders has been deadly silent all this time because they cut a deal. They said, basically, this is who the Democrat Party is now. It's the Bernie Sanders wing, which is, you know, the man who spent his honeymoon in, moon in Russia during the Cold, Cold War. And, uh, and that's who they are. They're, 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 I don't call them socialists. I don't communists. That's who that's what they're, that's what we call people with these beliefs 30 years ago, and they haven't changed their beliefs much. And so why change the language? Why accept their language? Progressive. And uh, so, I, so I don't see that. So I, I might disagree with Patrick on, 
on that one. I think they're much worse than uh, uh, the, the progressives that he uh, he's written about in the past. I th think his argument is mainly that a lot of the socialist communist rhetoric is kind of a front and that uh, they're really going to just open up opportunities for cronyism, like the new, the um, whatever they're calling it, Green New Deal is going to be just full of corporate welfare and whatever. Uh, I think that's, that's kind of always, that's from. always the case. Uh, and another thing, you guys, if you hadn't heard about this, there's a, a neat little video online by Bruce Yandel, Y A N D L E. So he, he's an old, he's a retired economics professor from Clemson, and he's a friend of the Mises Institute. He spoke there, I think, two years ago at the uh, Austrian Economics Research Conference, and he he's associated with something called the bootleggers and Baptist theory, and uh, about of government regulation, and uh, where a lot of government regulation, not all, are promoted by, uh, you know, well, well it prob alcohol prohibition. The bootleggers are the people who smuggled booze, so they're obviously in favor of prohibition, making alcohol illegal because it created a business for them, and then Baptist is sort of a general. Uh, word to describe re religious people who supported um, prohibition of alcohol for religious reasons. And they were a coalition that created prohibition, you know, for what was it, 12 years, we had, it was illegal to sell alcohol in the United States. And uh, Bruce Yandel talks about how a lot of government regulation is promoted in this way, where the, the greedy rent-seeking corporations will recruit some, uh, some sort of empty-headed priest or or minister somewhere who uh, to sort of promote uh, the cause. Uh, a good example would be uh, uh, banning imports from Asia uh, by saying, uh, you know, they have child labor in Asia, so we don't want to allow imports in Asia. Well, of course, the unions and the corporations who don't want to allow imports from Asia couldn't care less about the children in, in Asia. That's not their job. They care about their profit, their bottom line. And they know full well that if you prohibit imports from Asia, you will harm the children in Asia by creating even more poverty in Asia. They know that. It doesn't, doesn't take an economic genius to figure that out. But then they recruit naive ministers and, and, and religious people to, to be on their side to say, well, yeah, that's yeah, child labor. We're against child labor. And so that, and that's a, a modern version of the bootleggers and Baptists. And so, uh, but at the same time, I think, I think the Bernie Sanders type people and uh, AOC, where, you know, this young, young woman who grew up in uh, wealthy Westchester County who pretends to be from the barrio um, in Congress, uh, they are hardcore communists. And so they, they're not just, they're not just going to be the water carriers for big business. In fact, look at what uh, so-called AOC did when Amazon wanted to open up uh, a, a building in her district and employ 20,000 people. She killed it. Uh, she, she killed it. And so uh, if she wanted to be just uh, a bribe receiver from a big corporation, she would have taken uh, taken the money and ran, but she didn't. She, she actually killed it because she's a communist ideologue, in my opinion. No, that makes sense. Yeah. So uh, the next question I wanted to ask... Um, going off uh, topic of AOC, but um, Rothbard adopted a strategy of right-wing populism later on in his life to try to promote libertarianism. Uh, are uh, historical examples of populism leading to progress toward a more libertarian social order in America or in the rest of the world? Well, I guess, you know, as, as Bill Clinton might say, it all depends on how you, the meaning of populism. You know, that's, of what, of what that is. I think Murray Rothbard uh, thought, you know, his basic um, attitude toward the, uh, creating the Mises Institute and why it's so different from the Cato Institute and the, the Heritage Foundation and organizations like that is that really the business model of uh, Cato and Heritage and a lot of the others, and it, especially the ones in DC, is to try to uh, edu quote, educate congressional staffers who write the laws anyway, and other people, judges, things like that. Uh, Murray Rothbard's model for the Mises Institute, along with Lou Rockwell, was to educate the general public. And so if you're talking about populism, that's the public. That's who you're talking about. 
And whereas the business model of Cato and Heritage and the rest was to, uh, they thought they could educate the Washington elite but, uh, and, and influence them. But I think what has happened was the Washington elite has influenced them and, uh, and it caused them to, uh, to compromise. In fact, uh, I, uh, I can tell you guys an inside baseball story. I was at a, a Liberty Fund conference sometime around, must have been around 1990, something like that. And I sat at dinner with Milton Friedman and Ed Crane. You know, you know who Milton Friedman was, the famous economist. Ed Crane was the, the uh, president of the Cato Institute at the time. And Cato had not yet moved to Washington, D.C. I forget what exact year this was. Friedman was trying to talk him out of it. Don't build a building in Washington. Don't go to Washington. You'll be uh, captured by the Washington uh, crowd. And, and, and Ed Crane just put him off. No, that's, that's not going to happen. I'm in charge. I want it happen. I saw it happen. Yeah, I, was, I was one of the first adjunct scholars of the Cato Institute in the late 80s. And uh, my book with Jim Bennett, Underground Government, the Off-Budget Public Sector, was one of their very first books <clears throat> that they published. And, uh, and that was in 1983, that book was published, you know, ancient history. And, but in the next several years, I noticed that uh, exactly what Milton Friedman uh, said was gonna happen, happened. And so, uh, and it did, that they became, their goal was to get the Washington establishment to like them. And so they had to pull a lot of punches. You can't be too critical of the government. Uh, that's why they always uh, accepted uh, uh, Hayek. So if you're a lot of Hayek's writings were sort of social democracy, if you re even you read the, the Road to Serfdom, he comes out in favor of all sorts of government interventions. He says at one point, as long as it can pass a benefit cost test, uh, government should do it. And, uh, and so government can always concoct a phony benefit cost test to justify anything. Uh, and, and so, uh, but, uh, but they were always dismissive of Mises because Mises was too hardcore. And uh, early on when I was still an adjunct scholar at Cato, um, I published an article in the Cato Journal about something called industrial policy, which was uh, you know, government planning. In, in the 80s, uh, this was a big thing. Uh, that was uh, being discussed and uh, government planning. And I had one footnote in there referring to America's Great Depression by Murray Rothbard. And the editor of the Cato Journal called me up on the phone and we spent a half hour on the phone arguing over deleting that footnote because uh, Murray Rothbard was persona non gratis. He was not to be, we were not to cite him in any literature. Uh, and, uh, and I won the argument, we kept the footnote in, but it took me a half hour on the phone to insist I wanted to keep the footnote in. And so, the, so and, and that was, they had a personal dispute with Rothbard, uh, Charles Koch did, but also they didn't want the radical free market views of Mises or Rothbard being associated with Cato. Hayek was okay, because you could, you could always point to one of his books where he came out in favor of welfare, social security, and all these government regulations, safety regulation, and all this. And so that was acceptable uh, to them. And so uh, that, that's how, um, that's one way of answering your question, I think. So you bringing up Milton Friedman reminded me of a question that I've always wanted to ask uh, Austrian economists of your stature. Uh, what do you think? Because this is something that uh, when I was getting into libertarianism, I was myself was criticized for. And I let I read that a lot of people uh, have been criticized for this because Mel Friedman is perceived as a libertarian figure uh, and his flirtations with tyrants such as Pinochet or, you know, Reagan. I wanted to ask you, what do you think of that? And uh, any, you know, just any comments or thoughts on that? Friedman didn't have any relationship with Pinochet. Friedman had uh, uh, five or six graduate students who earned PhD degrees in economics at the University of Chicago who were from Chile. And the reason uh, he, uh, he had these students was that his colleague at the University of Chicago, Arnold Harberger, who was a, a famous Chicago school economist, his wife was Chilean. And through that connection, these young men came to the University of Chicago and earned PhD degrees in economics. They went back home to Chile 
And then they had this revolution, they had this, this uh, takeover by a communist government. And they, these students, invited Milton Friedman, their old professor, to give a couple of university lectures. And that was Milton Friedman's contact with Chile. He was not an advisor to Pinochet or anything like that. He gave a couple of lectures invited by his former students in Chile at a couple of different universities. And uh, they, he might have met, I don't know if he met Pinochet or not, since he was, you know, was a Nobel Prize winner uh, you know, at the time. So he, in the country, they probably didn't have too many Nobel Prize winners uh, lecturing at their universities. But it's a lie that he was a, uh, uh, some kind of advisor to Pinochet. And, uh, and, he, and of course, he, he said the same things that he, that he would say in his book and, and video, Free to Choose, Free Trade, uh, Minimal Government, uh, uh, you know, Modest Taxes, No Price Controls, and, and so forth. You know, Econ 101, uh, that's sort of the type of lectures he gave. But to a place like that that had never heard those ideas, it's kind of shocking. And so, uh, so that, that's not true. And now, Friedman... Friedman was a good popular writer. <clears throat> I know Walter Block has written a bunch of papers arguing with Friedman and calls him a statist and all that. But uh, when I was a freshman in college, way back, uh, uh, it was just after they got rid of all the stone tablets and started using books in the library. One of my professors used in uh, the first course I took in economics, economic, microeconomics principles. He used a, a regular textbook and a book of readings by Milton Friedman called An Economist's Protest. I still have that book, An Economist's Protest. It was a collection of Newsweek magazine articles. At the time, Friedman had written, uh, was taking turns with Paul Samuelson writing uh, articles on issues of the day, the draft, price controls, inflation, in Newsweek magazine. One week would be Friedman, next week is Samuelson. And this little book, uh, uh, An Economist's Protest, was uh, Friedman's articles from Newsweek magazine. And, and they were very libertarian. And so is his, uh, his book with his wife, Free to Choose, which is made into a video series. And it's still, still online. I, I've used it in my classrooms over the years, the video series, Free to Choose. Thomas Sowell is a guest in, in there, people like that. And, uh, and, and it's all very libertarian. And so I have nothing uh, wrong with that. But yes, he would, but Friedman was basically an establishment Republican economist. So he pulled a lot of punches and he distanced himself from people like Mises, which was not which who did not pull punches and was not afraid to criticize uh, politicians. Now to his credit, Friedman, when, when Nixon imposed price controls, he had been an advisor to Richard Nixon, informal advisor, he didn't work for him. And when Nixon uh, imposed price controls, uh, Friedman's friend, George Schultz, was, um, uh, what was he? He was, uh, I don't know if he was Treasury Secretary or the, I think he was the budget director under uh, Nixon. And Friedman visits the White House and Nixon tells Milton Friedman, don't blame George for the price controls that I, they put on your friend George. And Milton Friedman told Nixon, he said, oh, I don't blame George, I blame you for the price controls. And so he, so he told Nixon to his face, that, you know, I blame you, and it's a bad thing. It's a dumb idea. And, and so, and that was a libertarian thing. You know, how many libertarians have a chance to tell the president of the United States, you, you did a dumbass thing, and Milton Friedman uh, took the opportunity to do that, right, right to his face, not, not in an article in the Wall Street Journal or right, a place like that. And so, uh, so yeah, he, had, he did a lot for, he attracted a lot of people to libertarianism. Uh, you know, a lot of people would never have, have ever heard of these ideas at all. In the early days of the Mises Institute, we used to always ask the students, how did you find out about us? And the answer was almost always, I read Ayn Rand and I, a footnote in one of her books, she said, my favorite economist is Ludwig von Mises. That's how they, they got there. But a lot of them said, uh, you know, they, they liked Milton Friedman. They read maybe the same book I did as a freshman and, they, and then they, they wanted more. They wanted more than that. And they may have run across the Freeman magazine. And the Freeman, published by Fee, Foundation for Economic Education, uh, has published everybody in, in, those, in those days. The Hayek, Friedman, Mises. Uh, if you look at the old issues in the 1960s of the, of the Freeman, you see all these people. So if you, if you were really, well, you know, a serious 
college student at the time looking at and studying economics and you ran across Milton Friedman. Um, I ran across the Freeman myself uh, as a college freshman and that's how I got introduced to all these ideas. And so uh, I think other people would too. So I would give Fried Friedman a lot of credit for that. And, you know, while we're on economic topics and you're a PhD economist, I found one of your old Mises U lectures when I was looking up free market answers to market failures, because I had this professor who he was teaching a money and banking class and he was ramming market failures down our throats and watching your lecture was a breath of fresh air because it was such absurd things. And I think the two that stuck out to me the most about a year later was imperfect competition and the natural monopoly claims. So yeah. why are, why is imperfect competition not a market failure? And what's the issue with natural monopoly claim? Do you mean imperfect information? Uh, yeah. Imperfect. Inf but yeah. Imperfect information. Oh, imperfect information. Well, well, of course, uh, there's always imperfect information. You know, not, nobody is uh, omniscient as far as that goes. It's all a matter of how we use it. And certainly uh, the, the, the decentralized information in the free market is used much more efficiently than politicians could ever use. That's one of the reasons why socialism uh, never worked uh, anywhere and never could work anywhere because it centralizes uh, or pretends to anyway, it pretends to centralize decision-making power in the, in the hands of a relatively few people. And that just, you know, is one of the reasons. But, uh, you know, well, yeah, well, the, 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 um, the, uh, ar the argument, market failure argument, imperfect information. Well, if you, if you take a look at what they're saying, uh, it assumes, for example, that there should be in a perfect market, there should be no advertising because perfect information, which is assumed to exist under this model, means that the consumers know everything about what they want and where to get it, and the producers know everything about how to minimize the cost of producing the things the consumers want. And of course, in reality, the market is a discovery process. We as consumers discover what we want. You know, you know who, who would have known uh, uh, 50 years ago that, that I would want uh, uh, Zoom on my laptop computer. You know, I wouldn't even have known what a laptop computer was uh, you know, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, even. And so we, we discover what we want. And of course, uh, producers, businesses, uh, discover not only what people like, just look at the TV show Shark Tank. You know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of these entrepreneurs fail, some succeed, but it's all trial and error. Uh, based on uh, based on research, based on marketing research, but that's how markets work. And and the, and the model that economists adopted, beginning around the the 1930s, a perfect competition model, assumed all this away. Uh, and and there's a great article by Hayek called "The Meaning of Competition." It's online. Friedrich Hayek, "The Meaning of Competition," that totally destroys the the imperfect all of these the perfect competition model. You know, I've written about this also in, in a lot of my writings, but, but that will be the one article to look up uh, to read this about this. And, and in that article, he says, in perfect competition, there is no competition. It assumes away everything that normal human beings would think of as competition, price undercutting, advertising, product differentiation, all these things were, were assumed away by this crazy model called perfect competition. And so it's, it was easy for your professor and a lot of professors who I think committed fraud for 75 years by teaching this in their microeconomics classes because they taught what we call the nirvana fallacy. They, they set up this straw man of perfect competition that could never exist in, the, in reality. And then they compare that to the real world and they say the real world fails. They, and, but at the same time, they will say, Politicians never fail, though. If we put politicians in charge of this, they will correct all these failures perfectly. And it's so it's dishonest and it's stupid, in, in my opinion. And unfortunately, that's mainstream economics and many books because it's easy. I think mean, it's an easy thing to do to to, to compare uh, reality to utopia. And of course, utopia always looks better. And so. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty harsh, as you can tell, but I'm, 
uh, you know, there are still a lot of people who teach this way, and I think it's fraudulent. I think they're committing educational fraud when they when they teach this way about markets. Yeah, and it wasn't even like a principles of micro class. Like this was a three thousand level class, and then another. 3000 level class, another professor brought up. So they're teaching us from the second you start to the second you get your bachelor's and then probably going to keep going when you get a master's. And then they teach you Keynesian economics about how to centrally plan the economy (laughs) because capitalism has fails everywhere. That's basically what your your economics degree is, is about. If you don't, if you don't educate yourself in reality. You know, my, my own education, my, my first semester in graduate school at Virginia Tech, back in those days, it was called Virginia Polytechnic Institute. But once they got a good football team, they changed the name to Virginia Tech. I guess it sounds more footballish. But, uh, but anyway, the first semester we used, uh, one of the textbooks was The General Theory by John Maynard Keynes in macro, along with a big fat uh, macro book by a guy named Patinkin. And the, the macro economics people know who uh, Patinkin was. But anyway, the general theory was impossible to understand, still is. I don't think anybody has ever understand what the heck Gaines says in the general theory. But he wrote an article in the a journal called the Economic Journal in 1936, clear as a bell. And it, you, you had a, I perfectly understood what he was saying. And it, you know, bad as the ideas were, I understood what they were. But the, but a lot, so a lot of economics is made up to uh, economic theory is uh, made up to be perfectly intentionally confusing because they want to make people think that you're really sort of a higher order intellect because you can't you can't understand what I'm saying and and they but it's but that proved to me that if Keynes wanted to explain clearly what his ideas were he could do it and he did do it in the Economic Journal it's a British journal but in his book. He intentionally made it confusing as can be because he knew the academic world would be impressed by that. And it's gotten even worse, much worse since then with the extraordinary mathematization of economics that um, that's, drives everybody away and you, you don't really learn much. That's why the Mises Institute is so valuable because they've got these new initiatives like economics for beginners and economics for business which are introducing these, you know, easier to understand economics ideas to the general people. It's the populism, like you talked about, uh, for, for real life application instead of just doing math and writing papers back and forth to each other and intellectually jerking each other yeah. off, basically. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> not, yeah, not actually helping anybody. Yeah, yeah, intellectual masturbation, it used to be called. But there's a lot of that going on. That's, that's what most of the economics journals are. But... Uh, well, yeah, there's, I'll give you one, one example of, uh, in, in the economics department that I just retired from, Loyola University, you know, the guys are good, you know, they're good people, they're, they're well-meaning, and they, but they, and they teach what they've been taught, and what, what they were moving to, like the chairman of the department made a, a talk at a meeting right before I left, you know, retired, of his ideal situation for economics majors, they would take principles of economics, my principles of microeconomics. Then they would take a course in intermediate microeconomics, which is much heavier with math and everything. And then a third course in mathematical microeconomics, which is really heavy to all math economics. And he thought that would be perfect. But there's no way in the world anyone needs all of that to understand supply and demand and how markets work. And so you just read read a couple of chapters of Human Action by Ludwig von Mises. You would be vastly more educated in economics than all three of these courses that my former colleague was talking about. And so it would keep him busy. He likes to, he's a mathematician, so he likes to stand in front of a classroom and impress twenty year olds with how much math he knows. Uh, and, but uh, but but the twenty year olds who are in a classroom are not learning uh, much about real economics. And, and worse yet, like you said, they're learning dumb things like market failure theory. And uh, there, there's a big literature, you know, I, I taught a course called Law and Economics, and there's a big literature that debunks a lot of the market failure theories. It's mostly Chicago school oriented, but there are a lot of Austrian economists who write in this area too, in, in all sorts of ways. Uh, even uh, Ronald Coase, the old Nobel Prize winner in economics from Chicago, 
I wrote a famous article called The Lighthouse in Economics, where uh, for years and years and years, economists, when you get to the chapter in your textbook on public goods, they would use the lighthouse as an example of market failure. And he wrote this big, long article showing how uh, the British lighthouse system was private for, for uh, generations before the government took it over. And so he debunked the whole idea that you need government for lighthouses. And, and there's, a big, there's a pretty big literature like that. A lot of the, the Journal of Law and Economics, which Ronald Coase edited for about 40 years, uh, produced a lot of articles debunking a, a lot of the market failure theories. But the problem is they don't always make it into the textbooks that the students use. Uh, they made it into my classroom, but not, uh, not so many of the textbooks. Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a, something valuable that just gets missed out on because it's not convenient now. Uh, yeah. And one more question to, to finish up on, uh, given we've talked about kind of the direction of academia, the direction of politics nowadays, uh, do you think there's any, there are any big changes coming? I mean, Donald Trump's election was one big change, but politically, culturally, uh, I know Jeff Dice likes to talk about this, especially. Uh, is, there, is there some big change in the organization of, of politics coming, do you think, based on your historical knowledge? Do you see any patterns emerging? Well, well this election, uh, you know, I, I can't see the, the, the Trump voters uh, tolerating the radical socialists who now control the Democrat Party and vice versa. Uh, the radical socialists, one thing about Marxists is they think they know all the answers and they don't, they don't want to argue with you. Uh, they, you know, they want to they uh, censor you or worse, you know, uh, commit a riot in your town uh, and, and, and all that. They, 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 they want to get rid of you altogether. And they've achieved that pretty well in the universities, haven't they? They've pretty much censored out uh, uh, dissenting views in the university system and much of uh, you know, the so-called cancel culture. And that's, that's just Marxism 101. Marxists believe they know the truth and people who disagree with them are not just wrong, but immoral uh, in, in their view. And so that's, that's why they, they think when they, like if Walter Block were to show up to give a campus lecture, they would create a riot and they think they're taking the, the high ground, the moral high ground by censoring people like Walter Block or Tom Woods or me, uh, you know, the, the hell with academic freedom is their opinion, you know, there's, because that doesn't serve their interests, and their interest is imposing their, their crazy Marxist ideas on the whole population. And so if, if secession ever were to occur again, I would think if this, would, this could be a spark, this election could be a spark in, uh, in some states. And, uh, and I think it would be just great if California and New York seceded. They could, they could rename the place Obama Stan or something like that and, uh, and have their own little communist utopia, but just keep me out of it. And I think that would be a, a great outcome. But, but who knows? You know, I never, I never thought, you know, when I was much younger, I never thought I would see the Soviet Union implode. And so uh, and, and a lot of people didn't either. And so uh, who knows? But uh, if it ever, if ever there would be a spark for something like that, uh, I think this election might be it. Well, uh, Mr. DeLorenzo, I want to thank you a lot for coming on here. Uh, it was a really, this was probably our best interview yet. Uh, to our, all our listeners, I want to say, check out his articles on lewrockwell.com. Check out all of his books and please check out The Problem with Lincoln, his newest one. You can find them all at the Mises.org, uh, their little bookstore online. Uh, Tom, anything you want to say before we wrap up? I'll just say I'm going to email Tom Woods and tell him that you guys kept me on an hour and a half, and he only had me on for a half hour, I think, on his show. So, so I'm going to complain to him about that. Please do, remember. please but do. Thanks a lot. Another, another reason we're better than the Tom Woods show. Like, three times, but three times better, I think. <laughs> ah, there's another quote. Yeah. We got a new T-shirt. Yeah, we're going to advertise with that ball, one too. Cap, anyway. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we'll let you go. Thank you again. Okay, have a good weekend. Take care.